Hamner brought his signature southern flair to his only hour-long TZ script, Jess Bell. This story of love and witchcraft is a more nuanced trip into the zone with a line blurred between protagonist and antagonist. A prolific director and well-known stars rejoined the show for this production. So, did it have enough juice to top Hamner's two previous teleplays? Set in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, Billy Ben Turner and Elwyn Glover are set to be wed. At a celebration of their engagement, Billy's old flame, Jess Bell, walks out, scolded by the fact that Billy never proposed to her during their romance. Desperate, she goes to Granny Hart, a mysterious local woman rumored to be a witch looking to somehow buy Billy's love. With no money to pay her, Granny says she does hold something of value that will be taken soon and hands over a potion. Jess Bell drinks it as Granny casts a spell. The young girl is unwittingly transformed into a witch herself. Upon seeing Billy again, the man can't help himself. He's fixated on Jess and leaves his own engagement party to be alone with her. However, Jess quickly finds out that she transforms into a leopard every night and struggles to get away from Billy before the metamorphosis. She begs Granny Hart to release her from this curse, but the witch refuses telling her to embrace her darkness and take the love she paid for. Conflicted, Jess Bell goes back and forth on what to do before giving in to her new evil side and agreeing to marry Billy. One afternoon, Jess is warned by Ellie that some of the men in town are going to hunt the big cat that's been roaming around lately. That night, Jess Bell's mother discovers her secret. However, she fails to keep her daughter's request, unable to keep Jess's leopard form inside her room overnight. Ellie and the townsmen eventually corner the leopard in a barn and shoot it. Instead of falling over dead, it disappears in a puff of smoke, leaving only the engagement ring Billy gave Jess. With the spell broken, Turner refocuses his attention to Glover. But the question remains, is Jess Bell really gone? Directing his eighth episode for the series was Buzz Kulik, who said he loved Hamner's teleplay. That admiration for the material extended to the cast and even the writer himself after seeing how the finished product turned out. It is a unique tale for The Zone, with Jess Bell being presented as a tragic, somewhat relatable character to feel sorry for. She fights her curse valiantly at first, but Granny Hart's words eventually get her to accept her fate. Take what you paid for. And Francis, coming back to the show after the season one classic, The After Hours, carries the episode on her shoulders, covered by a black wig, to contrast Laura Devon's fair hair as Ellie. She's portrayed as sympathetic for most of the story, and it's easy to see the character's point of view on the Billy-Ellie relationship. He was mine for a while. Kept it quiet what went on between him and me. Never took me any place for the world to know. He made me promises. And the fire in me burned as hot as the white sun. The virus turned to ashes now, Jess. It still burns here. But it's different with Elwyn and me. I love her in a, a quiet way. She's also misled into the bargain with Granny Hart, where the older woman exploits her naivete and genuine love for Billy Ben. What is the price? You'll know in the midnight hour of time. Jeanette Nolan 100% steals the show as Granny Hart. Her first shot sets up this dark, evil figure, but a moment later, the woman looks fairly normal to answer her door. Then you start to hear her talk and use those facial expressions, and it's obvious this lady was having a ton of fun. She's my favorite part of the story. Be a witch. Take a witch's pleasure. Take the man you bargain for. Give him a witch's love. Hart was a huge departure for Nolan from her first TZ episode, The Hunt, also written by Earl Hamner. This character just bathed in her own demented, dark charisma and was supremely entertaining. Ain't I beauty? How'd you like me for a sweetheart? Laura Devon as Ellie isn't given anything too memorable to play with, except for one moment we'll get to later, but she does a good job holding down the fort as the only real straight-laced main character. James Best made his third and final appearance as the affable Billy Ben. Even though his character isn't exactly squeaky clean, he tries to do right by his own commitments. You feel sorry for him and Ellie when Jess puts him under her spell. 
He really becomes a plaything for a while as the new witch goes back and forth on what to do, struggling with her own conscience. Best was a noteworthy part of the episodes he was featured in, always a natural presence who was fun to watch on screen. Some other returning zoners were George Mitchell, Jim Bowles, and John Lorimer. The leopard that Jess turns into was apparently a bit of a hassle for Buzz Kulik and the film crew. The animal was said to have just laid around whenever they tried to get their shots. It definitely looks comfortable laying up on that roof, but they got a few decent takes with it, the best one being when it breaks out of the window shutters to Jess Bell's room. That was actually quite impressive. I know the transformation into this big cat was supposed to be disturbing, but it just looks like the most docile, chill feline after Jess transforms. Looks are deceiving when it comes to wild animals, but the visual just took away from the mystique a bit, I guess. Earl Hamner said in a few different interviews that he originally wrote her to turn into a tiger and also a panther. I'm not sure which is correct, but the panther probably would make more sense considering Jess Bell's jet black mane. The witch rules in this episode I'm not very familiar with, but I'm sure the transformations, weakness to silver and all that were a part of some legends somewhere. Usually, you hear about the silver thing when dealing with werewolves and some vampire myths, but they're all kind of connected, right? Also, you could just make up your own rules depending on the story. In a refreshing original score, Van Cleave provided some well-placed music across the installment. It definitely aided the atmosphere, especially that little folk song that kept popping up. By day she knew a woman's form, by night a witch's spell. For love of Billy Turner, a curse was just bad. A year after Jess Bell's death, Billy and Ellie have finally reached their wedding day. Before the ceremony, Jess's mom, Ozzy, visits Turner to warn him about her daughter's return. She says she found a wart toad in Jess Bell's room a few months ago, and when she tried to get rid of it, it disappeared in a cloud of smoke. Ozzy hands over a silver hairpin of her daughter's that she hopes Billy will use to protect Ellie at the wedding. Silver is said to be the only thing that can scare a witch. After seeing and killing a spider on Ellie's wedding dress when they're exchanging their vows, more strange things happen at the newlyweds' home. Glover's hand is momentarily moved by an unseen force attempting to scratch her husband, and a rat is spotted on their clock. Billy hands Ellie a Bible to protect her and rushes to Granny Hearts to try and find a way to be rid of Jess Bell's evil spirit. The old witch tries to trick him at first, but Turner pays with coins for the secret. However, he returns home to see that Ellie has been possessed. Come on, Billy Ben. Dance with me in the moonlight. Running into the house, he dresses up a mannequin in Jess Bell's unused wedding dress and stabs it with her silver pin. The young witch appears in the dress for a moment before dropping dead and disappearing. Ellie is knocked out at the door from the ordeal, but is ultimately unharmed. The couple then see a falling star overhead, which is said to only happen when a witch dies. The story finishes up with the folk song that was played throughout the episode. Dark was Jess Bell. Both they loved the same man, and both they loved him well. Creepiest part of the story was Ellie's possession. This was Devin's one big moment to shine with Francis's voice spilling out of her mouth. She nailed it. When Jess finally dies, there's a smile on her face before she falls over. I think we're led to believe her death was sort of a mercy killing. She did mention to Granny Hart that she'd rather be dead than a witch at one point. What you are, you're going to be till you die. Then I hope I die soon. A tragic yet welcomed fate for a perennially lovesick young woman. There are some things that kind of bug me about the show, like how quickly Ellie and her family gave up on Billy Ben and accepted his attraction to Jess Bella's witchcraft. I mean, this was mere seconds after he walked out with her. Wouldn't the Glovers have at least gone after them once before deciding that? Jess Bell bewitched him. To be frank, Jess Bell isn't one of my favorites. I'm more of a fan of Hamner's season three episode, The Hunt, if I was to pick from his three scripts this far in. But I've grown to like this one more and appreciate the craft put into it over the years. It's worth a recommendation for some really fun performances and a very different atmosphere from most other installments. Rod Serling doesn't even have an ending narration. 
Jess Bell herself is also a morally gray character that stuck out from a lot of the other leads on the show. She's not exactly the Jezebel her name would suggest. Give this episode a watch and see if it's your cup of tea, or in this case, which is brew, made especially in the Twilight Zone. Warm was Ellie Glover, cold dead was Jess Bell, and husband would be Billy Ben of the one he loved so well.